Welcome to Seeking God's Way Bible Study Series, which leads to a new life. Before you, you have your booklet, and we're going to be using this booklet for our Seeking God's Way Bible Study Series. Well, Marvin, well, Randy, we're on our last lesson. Page 15 of our chart set. And this page is uh, oh, probably the funnest page of all of them. Once a person becomes a Christian, then it is truly the most wonderful life. So our chart is entitled, The Christian Life is a Wonderful Life. And so uh, the passages on our chart are all designed to show us how wonderful the Christian life actually is. A lot of the passages we're going to be familiar with because we've read them once before at one time or another. Some we haven't, but a lot of them will sound familiar because we've used them in different ways. But as we go through them, we just want to you know, realize how wonderful being a Christian is because it is truly the greatest life on earth. And if a person wants the solution to life on earth, here it is. It's all in one, uh, one book. So, uh, and we've been studying that book, and so we're going to start here with that the Christian life is a new relationship, and we're going to start right there where it says, New Creation, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. He is a new creation, all brand new. Okay, so how, how should we look at ourselves? New. We're created new. Now, of course, we're speaking spiritually. Where I'm still the same old fellow. I still make mistakes, and, uh, and we're going to talk a bit about that. If, if, if a mistake happens, what do we do? That's part of our chart as well. But we're a new creation. This is how we should view ourselves in Christ. He takes the old away and replaces it with the new. We have a new example, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostilities from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So, who's our new example? Christ. Yeah, Christ? Absolutely. No mistake. And isn't it wonderful the way he says it? Fix your eyes on Jesus. We value our eyesight. And in this idea, and of course it's a human idea in a spiritual sense. We fix our eyes on his principles. We fix our eyes on the scripture. We fix our eyes on obeying him. But we fix our eyes on Jesus because he is the perfecter of our faith. We have new growth. 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 11. This is that passage that uses, uh, in the NIV, it uses the word supplement your faith with. And this is a wonderful passage, though, uh, dealing with the idea of a new growth system. Okay, 3 through 11? Yes, please. Just take a deep breath and off we go. Okay. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfaithful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be the more zealous to confirm your call and election, for if you do this, you will never fall. So there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Okay? And isn't it really a passage about new growth that God provides us everything we need and then we have some of these commodities. It's like a, like a vitamin, mineral supplement. And we begin to add to our faith all these wonderful things ending up with brotherly affection or brotherly love. And, and all of this binds together what the Christian life is all about. You could actually go through each one of the things and look them up and you could examine them and see what each one of them is and how each one of them works together to make this magnificent life. And when they're used properly, they, they fill the world for us in every way. So it's a new growth. And, we, and it actually kind of gives us direction. Mm -hmm. We're going to grow a certain yeah. way so we grow this way. Uh, the Christian life is a new hope. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when, we, when He is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who has this hope. What's the hope? The hope of seeing Christ someday. Seeing yeah. Christ? Mm -hmm. The hope of being salvation? salvation. Yeah. The hope of being with him? Mm -hmm. hope of, you see, I mean, there's all kinds of wonderful hopes. But we have a hope the world simply does not have. So Christians have a unique hope, a unique perspective, new, unique relationship. And I love it that it says we shall be like Him. And we'll be like yeah. Him. Yeah. You see. So we got an anticipation. We know what we're like now. Yeah. We want to be like Him. Yeah, yeah very much so. Uh, and finally, we have a new love. Matthew chapter 22, 37 through 39. Well, 22, 37 through 39. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's such a, a wonderful statement of Jesus, but it, it reiterates the first and greatest command. Love God with everything, with, with your whole being. Heart, soul, and mind. Okay? So we have, as Christians, a brand new relationship. And that relationship fills our lives in every way as these new Christians. It makes life worth living. We, should, we are walking with God. Uh, so we have in this relationship, this new relationship, a new walk, a new way of walking, a new way of thinking, a new way of approaching situations, a new way of, of trying to please my Lord. We walk in the light, 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. Walking in the light. So when we walk in the light, that last part says, he cleanses us from all sin. Such a beautiful type of picture that is painted. He is the light. And he is the one that cleanses us. And so, as we've seen, all, this, all these things come back to Jesus. We uh, walk as Christ did. 1 John chapter 2, 3 through 6. And by this we may be sure that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, but disobeys his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly love for God is perfected. By this we may be sure that we are in him. He who, sa he who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Walk in the same way as Jesus walked, keeping his commands. Uh, such a beautiful picture, too. Here we have, we can almost see the feet of Jesus performing his ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are recorded for us to help us understand his walk, 
his thinking, his approach, his ideals. And in these things we walk. And the closer we can walk to those things, the better the life actually is. And we walk with love. Second John 6. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Walk in it. Hey, you know, you, you, this a wonderful picture of walking with Christ, talking with Christ, following Christ, uh, seeing what he accomplished and how it affects me and, and how it makes my life so full, so vibrant as a new Christian. There are some things, of course, as we've already noted in John, he says a couple of times there that we need to obey him. Yeah. And some of the things that are very important to this wonderful Christian life is, for example, as we're going to look at, that we must worship. And there are, there are commands of Christ that help us with our wonderful life. We need the support of the saints. We need the support of what he has created in his church, which we've already studied in our lessons. So let's go to Christ's presence in Matthew 18, 20. We've actually read this one before in one of our lessons. We made a, you know, a bit of a lengthy spoke about it. But it's a beautiful passage that talks about Christ being with us. <clears throat> For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Hmm. You're together? I'm in your midst. How often should we gather? Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Well, it's been 2,000 years and we've been seeing the day approach. And well, so the idea of making good habits and being together. Well, you know it's closer now than it was... 2,000 years ago. At least in our time it is. Yeah, in our time it is. And, yeah. and this idea of him being able to come or us leaving, whichever happens to come first, <laughs> likely us leaving maybe, but he might come too. Uh, still, the picture is all the more. Do you catch mm -hmm. the all the more in there? Mm -hmm. Not less gathering. Mm -hmm. Seems like in our world today, everything seems to be the less because we're so busy. If we want the most magnificent Christian life, we need each other. And so the gathering together is very vital to that picture. How? John 4, 23 through 24. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So you see, we've seen this passage as well. You know, spirit and truth or the ways we must worship Him. And, and Jesus is quite emphatic. This is, we're going to worship. It's not written on the idea if you decide to worship. No, 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 no. It's the true worshipers. One of the beautiful things we found is when we become a Christian, we become Christ, and He gets into us, and we are trying to follow Him. Then by all means, we want to worship Him in that way. Um, what? What do we worship? Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That one says reasonable service. Some other translations use the idea of worship in this picture. And, and so in the, in, in the beautiful passage here, we have worship with ourselves, our whole beings, not conforming to the world, but conforming to Christ, building on our faith. These are all wonderful pictures that we've looked at already that help us along this magnificent life of being a Christian. Without these principles, there is no Christian life. A lot of people want to be Christian, but not be what they should be. And then they wonder why their life is not good. Because they're not following the examples that are laid down by Christ to make this magnificent life. I like that it says renewing your mind. Renewing your like mind day by day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Day by day. So the idea of studying the scripture, mm -hmm. being together and worshiping the scripture, growing in the scripture. We had that supplement your faith. You know, all these beautiful pictures that are painted about how we grow in doing this. Uh, usually if we want to really accomplish something, you know, we, we can't just... Uh, 
I hope it happens. Yeah. If we want uh, if we want big muscles, we're going to have to work our muscles. If we want to lose weight, we've got to work at losing weight. It's not something that just ha we we get in a regiment and we literally see the same type of language. Whether we're walking in the steps of Christ or we're studying from His Scripture, it's an ongoing process to the very end of our lives. It is a great life doing good works. Ephesians two ten. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He even gives us things we're supposed to do. Good works, whatever they may be, they can be found in every area of life. It can be good works to our husbands and wives. They can be good works to our children. They can be good works to those in need. They can be good works to those not in need. They can be, these are good works. And he gives us good works. It might even go back to the greatest command, love the Lord your God, but in the second greatest is love your neighbor as yourself. Good works. Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are in the household of faith. I always like this because it ends up with saying, do good to all, uh -huh. but especially <laughs> very close to the attention to the Christians because if they're in need, they come first. Right. And so God wants us to take care of each other mm -hmm. foremost, but don't forget the rest of the world. You know, and It's so easy to get caught in one or the other uh, in some way or another. But these are the, are the good works of the new life and the new Christian. The spreading of the gospel, Mark 16, 15 and 16. Part of our good work is that we have found what everybody needs. And we should be excited about the fact that if they want a good life, and most people don't have one, then we have the answer. And a lot of people are asking the question, why am I here and what is my purpose and all these kind of things, you see. We have that answer. So it should compel us, as the Great Commission says, which you're going to read for us here, that we should spread the message of Jesus. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Very simple, and we've read it many times through our study. And in this, we have the great commission that we should go and spread the message of Jesus, the gospel, mm -hmm. to everyone that we can. Uh, you know, uh, along this Christian journey, though it is the most magnificent life, we still have a struggle. Some get the misconception when we become a Christian, all the problems go away. <laughs> it would be nice. <laughs> and that'd be nice. But you know, one thing that we need to appreciate is that when we become a Christian, the devil loses one of his. And he wants that one back. He'll do anything he can to get it back. Okay? And it's also funny that sometimes being Christians, we'll get a little bit uh, comfortable or, or, or a little bit uh, complacent in our walk a little bit, and we'll quit paying close attention to the things that can drive us away from Christ. Because as much as we can become a Christian, we can leave Him and lose our salvation, which is many passages we've looked at through Scripture that illustrate that picture. So we need to be careful. Keep up our guard. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 12. Uh, no, it's 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 12. I'm sorry. You're in the right place. I said the wrong place. <laughs> I was just going to look again. And... No, no, you're right. Okay. okay. So we're in 10, 1 through 12. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all your, our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, 
and do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by ser serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Okay. That says it. Yeah, you know, and we, uh, yes. we actually read through this a little bit whenever we talked about the Old Testament and how we use it back in our Old Testament chart. And, uh, and we even looked at some of the examples of not only the positive but the negative. Uh, we follow Abraham, we don't follow Nadab and Abihu type <laughs> picture, you know. We, right. we, we looked at those things, and this passage just kind of gives us a, uh, Paul just gives us a nice little overview. We need to be careful. These people were the chosen people of God, and they failed. They failed terribly, and God punished them terribly because of their failure. God provides a way, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is the next verse after what we just read. Okay. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is a nice ending to this thought, you know, but at the same time, this is, of course, written to Christians, mm -hmm. and it pertains to Christians. This is a promise to Christians, not non-Christians. So for Christians, we even have certain promises that are magnificent. These promises say, you're going to be tempted like everybody. You're going to have to choose, just like everybody chooses. But because you're a Christian, I'm going to make sure you got a way out, you see. I, I often have wondered about that, thinking to myself anyway, well, that undoubtedly might mean that those who aren't Christians, who are tempted and fall in, maybe they can't find their way out. That's what the message of Jesus is all about, to help them find their way out. That's what our evangelism is all about, is because they can't find their way out. They're lost. And how many I have heard, well, I read the Bible once, but I just couldn't, you see, they can't find their way out. They're looking and they can't find. And they need help finding. And that's our purpose. We help them find the way out. Jesus helps. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the appropriation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. We have an advocate, appropriation, or propitiation, some translations say. The idea of a, a go-between, one who sacrificed himself for me. A lawyer. A lawyer, advocate. well, basically yeah. an advocate. Yeah. Uh, we, so we have something special between us and God. That's what the, the Christian life is, the greatest life. Even though we struggle, maybe as everyone does in some situations, we have an avenue. We go to God in prayer. He answers the prayer. We, we have a way to, to work our way out because we've got our eyes fixed on Jesus and we see a hope that is valid, is beautiful, is special. And so it gives us the ability to overcome things in a way other people simply do not have. So we do need to be careful, but we also need to be excited about the promises that he gives us. Ah, uh, do things go wrong? Oh yes, things go wrong. And so when things go wrong, we even get help from Scripture in this area. I've just added three here to just kind of flavor it a little bit as to help us along that path. But things do go wrong. We sin. We fall short of what we would love to be able to accomplish. What do we do? Well, we've got a few passages that help us. Acts 8, 18 through 24. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. 
Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. We have a multiple example. We used this once before as well, but we have multiple example here where Simon wanted a gift given that was not allowed. He offered him money to buy it. You know, and Peter says, repent. Maybe God will maybe God will forgive you. But Simon was a pretty smart character. He knew he needed more than just his own prayer. He asked them to pray for him. He needed to do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ask, ask them to pray for him. So we get two pictures from this. When things go wrong, we should repent and pray to God. But it might even be advantageous for us to have other Christians pray with us. Uh, because that's very helpful to us. It supports us. The point of one of the many points of the Lord's church is to get the support that we need when things go wrong. And things always go wrong. In a world where Satan wants us back so bad that he'll do anything within his power, we need all the support we can get. Be confident in prayer. 1 John 5, 13-15 These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Hmm, what does that tell us? Uh, confidence. That confidence yeah. that he is going to hear us. Did you catch the little part that says according, according to, his, to will? his will? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. little right. part that's added in there. It sounds like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Your will be done. Okay? Very important that whenever we, uh, whenever we talk about praying, that we pray in the proper manner. And that's illustrated for us in Scripture. But one of those very important ingredients is that it's the will of God mm -hmm. in this. So when things go wrong, we repent, we pray, and we need to have confidence that God's going to do what He says He'll do. He's promised to forgive us, you say. There's no mistaking He'll forgive us if we truly repent of what we have done. Right, just don't go out and do it again. And don't just go do it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Confess them to God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a simple verse, but notice it says, get on our knees and pray to God and tell him about it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, It's not a, a, a difficult thing because we can do it anywhere, anytime, anyhow. He's everywhere listening to us. And so when we fail, what's the problem of stopping for a moment and saying, yeah, Lord, I did it again. Please help. It can be as simple as that. And find comfort and hope and direction and desire not to do these things. Well, God knows we did that, and he provides us all those things you just said through prayers of forgiveness exactly, and repentance. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that is part of the magnificent hope of the Christian life. Because things always go wrong. Yeah. Things always go wrong. And they will go wrong because we're human in that scene. All right. So we come down to our last little bit, and it says, Be faithful. Now, there are quite a few little passages. We've just got a few here, but there's a lot of passages that talk about being faithful. But one that is most, uh, most important, I guess, or, or, or such a nice one, is this one in Revelation 2.10. And I put it in our, little, in our little red box right here on our chart. See? Right, yeah. right there. Uh, read it right out of the box there because it's, it's Revelation 2.10b, as you can see, which is the second half of the verse. Ah, okay. What, what, go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, go ahead, Mark. You just want the second half? Yeah, be, just be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. So are you supposed to be faithful? Yes. Faithful. We work our whole lives trying to be faithful to our loving Savior who will save us. Study your Bible, 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 
Okay. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Remember where we read that one the first time? Mm -hmm, the very beginning. Right yeah. on page one. That was our first introduction passage there. A workman who is approved, who correctly handles the word of God. Are we to study it? Yes. We're to grow in it, study it. You see, our lessons that we've been studying only give us a, a nice flavor and overview. There's enough information in our charts to, to get you started in every angle of study. You can go back, and that's why it's your chart, to go back and look at the different aspects. And then from there, you can expand that study to the horizon. You know, uh, it, This is not intended to be a wear-for-all of the study of the Scripture. It's, a, it's intended to get us from one place to the new life to be in a wonderful Christian life. And then your responsibility begins to study the Word of God. And a lot of people do that. They go back and they begin in, in, in the first chart and they go back through it and start cross-referencing and looking up the different ideas because they'll lead you in all kinds of magnificent directions. Study your Bible. Pray and rejoice. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Now if you look on your chart here, uh, Marvin, you've got pray and rejoice and think positive. And they're uh, 4, 4 through 7, and 4, 8 through 9. Just read all the way down to 9 for me, will you? Sure. Thank you. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentle, gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue in it, there is, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Oh, it, it starts out, and, and you can spend a lot of time here, but it starts out with the idea of don't worry. And when you do, which is always, <laughs> right? Then pray and supplicate, and the God of heaven and earth will relieve that beyond our understanding. And then he tells us how. You see, he doesn't just leave us hanging. He, he tells us how. He says, now think about these things, and look at the beautiful list. There's nothing negative in this list. It is all positive things to try to think about. Uh, are we able to accomplish that perfectly? Well, of course not. We're humans. But this is our goal. When, whenever we get depressed, where do we go? Here. Think on these things. And that renews your mind. And that renews your mind. Okay. You know, the Christian life is truly a worthy life. It's worth the effort. It, it, no matter how much uh, it takes for us to conform to the way of Christ, in the end, if we can accomplish even really the, you know, the surface it's the most magnificent life. And Colossians chapter 1, 9 through 14 tells us that. 1, 9 through 14. 1, 9 through 14. Okay. Thank you. And so from the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Yep. And you uh, want to go on down? Go ahead and read yeah, on down. 14, okay. Yep. Um, May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
Yeah, I don't think you could conclude our lesson any better than that passage, now can you? No, that's good. Uh, it's just so full, so rich with the wonderful life that the Christian life is. After we've looked at all these passages, we can only appreciate that the Christian life is truly the best that this earth can possibly offer. The only way it's going to get better is to go home. And when we go home, we will then find eternal life.